connecting to the cloud. We're recording and we're recording. All right, good morning, everybody. Today is August 28th, and we are all here for Wonderland Book Club. My name is Alice Osborne, and we are the, uh, we're here to discuss the Hell's Angels Letters by Margaret Ann Harrell, Hunter Thompson, and the Making of an American Classic by Norfolk Press. This book is by Norfolk Press. We have an international panel. We, our panelists hail from Raleigh, Boston, California, Kentucky, and Ireland. And we are, um, and I'm your host, Alice Osborne. Uh, a couple of housekeeping. If you are a uh, participant, please mute your, your, uh, your voice. And then we are, uh, we're also recording on Facebook Live. And we are also um, recording this for posterity. So we are in the cloud. So we're doing a lot, a lot of great things. I am so grateful that our panelists all are here today. Uh, Margaret, it's a beautiful book. Um, Ron, you collaborated with Margaret, beautiful illustrations. It is a masterpiece. And I'm so grateful that I was asked to, uh, and this all came together. And we are, uh, we're very grateful this is, this is happening. So again, this is Wonderland Book Club. We are a, a uh, organization that is affiliated with the North Carolina Writers Network. I started Wonderland Book Club way back in April of 2008. We were, uh, we're, we've been meeting monthly since 2008, discussing books through a literary and writing lens. Although most, um, about uh, most of our uh, folks in Wonderland are writers and have published books that are later have that later have been Wonderland books. Uh, but what we what makes us different is that we uh, the authors discuss their books in Wonderland. So we are not uh, just talking about books of folks who live somewhere else. Our authors come to us, and since the pandemic started, we have been having Zoom conversations, which allows more of us to get together. And even though we lose it, we don't have everyone in the same room, we still have everybody uh, across Zoom rooms, and which allows us to have folks um, multiple places, multiple states. So it's, it's still a blessing trying to keep that, to try to keep that in mind. Uh, well, let's start off with our panel, introducing our lovely panel. I've known Margaret Harrell. I was trying to figure out, Margaret, if we, we probably met, I want to say 2011 or 2012. So we've known each other. We've been friends for eight, nine years. And when, and I was, uh, I was asked to, uh, to help uh, proof this book, Keep This Quiet Too, and uh, part of the trilogy. And Margaret was back in 2014, she was our, one of our Wonderland Book Club authors for Keep This Quiet Three. And Margaret is hands-on with life. She's a dual national, has lived and written in Morocco, Switzerland, and Belgium, of course, as well as the U.S., and she is a Greenville, North Carolina native. The copy editor, assistant editor of Hell's Angels, which was published in 1966, and other remarkable books at Random House. She worked as a copy editor at Random House, and Jim Silberman was her editor, and sadly, Jim just passed away a couple weeks ago at the age of 93. She was also the international coordinator of a museum project in Belgium. She now lives in North Carolina in Raleigh. Uh, she's a longtime freelance book editor, a light body meditation teacher, and a cloud photographer. She has 13 published books, including the Keep This Quiet memoir series. Her website is margaretharrell.com. Yay for Margaret. It's 1967, the publication. Oh, 1906. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. January, just over the line. Just over the line. Yeah, because I saw it on the copyright. It's in 1966. Like, yes. Publication just over January. Yeah. 67. yeah, 67. Ron Whitehead is the founder of the Louisville Gonzo Fest and is a, he is a beat poet laureate. He's the beat poet laureate of Kentucky from 2019 to 2021. And I'm glad that he is um, awesomely in that position. And he also received the City of Louisville Proclamation, that was a year ago, for Lifetime Achievement of Supporting the Arts. He's a poet, a writer, an editor, a publisher, an organizer, a scholar, and he has produced over 3,000 art events from New York City to the Netherlands. Uh, Ron has also taught at the University of Louisville, New York 
University, Trinity College in Dublin, and the University of Iceland. Welcome, Ron. Great to see you, Ron. And next we have Dr. Rory Patrick Feehan. He's a PhD. He's a Hunter S. Thompson scholar and the founder of totallygonzo.org. He graduated with a doctorate in English language and literature from the University of Limerick in 2018. He has spoken at Gonzo Fest Louisville and at the Speed Art Museum Louisville on the opening night of their exhibit, Gonzo, the Illustrated Guide to Hunter S. Thompson. He's a regular contributor to Beatdom. He also has recently contributed a piece on Thompson to the encyclopedia, American Political Humor, Masters of Satire and Their Impact on U.S. Policy on Culture. Hmm. Welcome, Dr. Rory Behan. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here and talking with you today. Really looking forward to what you all have to say. Thank and you. What you have to say, so thank you. Cheers. Yes, cheers. <laughs> William McKean is a professor and the chairman of the Department of Journalism at Boston University. He is the author or editor of 13 successful books, including Outlaw Journalist, Mile Marker Zero, and Everybody Had an Ocean. McKean teaches courses on journalism, history, literary journalism, and rock and roll in American culture. He previously taught at Western Kentucky University, University of Oklahoma, University of Florida, where he chaired the Department of Journalism, and he's right now in Boston. So welcome, Bill McKean. Hi, everybody. Nice to see everybody. Good to see you. Yeah, I hope everyone's well. All good. And our last, uh, but not least, uh, panelist hails from California right now, where it's seven o'clock in the morning. Peter Richardson teaches humanities and American studies at the San Francisco State, at San Francisco State University. His latest book about Hunter S. Thompson will be published by the University of California Press. His previous publications include books about the Grateful Dead, Ramparts Magazine, and Carrie McWilliams, Hunter S. Thompson's editor at The Nation Magazine. Thanks, Alice. Thank you. Uh, it seems like we have a little bit of an echo going on. I don't know who, how we can alleviate that. Um, let's see, but uh, maybe if um, the panelists, if you're not, if you're not answering a question, if you could go ahead and mute, and then that way we can, we can be as uh, quiet as we can. We'll see if that works. All right, so our first question is to Margaret. How did this book start? Um, I hesitate and pause before beginning the answer because there's so many irregularities involved in how this book came to be. It's like, I wish I could remember the word, but in the Italians have a, a word and even a, an organization about unlikely events. Um, surreal, absurd, it starts with P-A-T, pat or something. It's really like that. So the starting for me was the irregular moment when I was given the manuscript, but the author was given no, no physical access to me at the end of the process. So to explain how this happened, you'd have to understand the total difference of publishing in those days. So I was a copy editor, but also assisted the editor-in-chief, Jim Silberman. He gave many books to me, and this was one. Normally, he'd give me the book, we would discuss it, he, he, then I would do my copy editing, he would look at it, and then the author would come in and sit beside me for maybe a week, day after day, we would talk over everything, they would look at all the marks, they would go over to a hotel and fix things and come back the next day. But this, these letters would never have existed had we followed protocol. Jim Silverman had met Hunter by going out to San Francisco. And again, that's a kind of funny synchronicity. We, the book is published in San Francisco. So in 1960, either five or six, Jim, six, I'd say, Jim went out to, to San Francisco to, to meet Hunter and for some reason decided not to bring him to New York. Therefore, we communicated by phone and letters an irregularity. Second irregularity, I left Random House and I was, after three years, and I was thinking, will I take the letters with me? Who, who owns me or them? And it was like a toss-up. 
we both owned them. And I would, I don't know if I could have made myself leave them behind, but there was no question because by another irregularity, my wonderful head chief uh, copy editor, who loved me, decided to make an issue over my leaving. She put up a fuss. She didn't want me to go. She wouldn't give me extra time to pack up. She said, be out at midnight. And at midnight, I was at Random House with the night watchman. And I said, well, what to do about these letters? I have to be out by midnight. And I said, oh, they're mine. And I took them. And then beyond that, the other irregularities were that the letters had to survive in acidic paper for 50 years. And they, fortunately, they were not in my carry-on. And I lived in four countries, including Morocco. Fortunately, they were not in my carry-on that was stolen at the carry bus service, this right in front of my eyes, and they were not in my storage that had fire ants. They somehow sailed through all the challenges. And I will turn it over to, and, and then I started, after Hunter died, I wrote, keep this quiet to start using excerpts. Let me turn it over to Ron about how, when I sent Keep This Quiet to him at the Gonzo Fest, I also sent it to Rory, uh, Patrick Feehan, and also to Bill McKean. They welcomed me with open arms. But let me tell you how the next irregularity <laughs> happened by turning it to Ron. Okay, I hope you hear me. I met my writing hermitage on Cherokee Road in the Highlands Hunter's stomping ground when he was growing up as a boy and then as a juvenile delinquent. Can you hear me, Margaret Ann? I can hear you great, Ron. Keep going. Okay. You're, you're sounding great. I can okay. hear you. Okay, good. Um, here's my collaborator's note from the Hells Angels letters. At Gonzo Fest Louisville 2014, my sweetheart Jen Bug and I listened to Margaret Ann Harrell's presentation on Hunter S. Thompson's Hell's Angels. Afterwards, while dining with Margaret Ann, Jen suggested that Margaret Ann's letters exchanged with Hunter and the story of her work and relationship with him should be published. A lengthy conversation ensued which eventually led to my collaboration with Margaret Ann on what we have come to call the book. What a journey it has been and what a joy to work with Margaret Ann, the rare primary source for unseen letters and untold stories on this important work that stands shoulder to shoulder with the other great books on one of the most original voices in the history of journalism, literature, and culture, Louisville native son, Hunter S. Thompson. But the twist to this story is that there are two protagonists. This is also the story of the brilliant Margaret Ann Harrell. I am honored by and grateful for our collaboration. Thus led, uh, thus started a six year journey of craziness, synchronicities that eventuated into the birth of this beautiful, gorgeous coffee table book with over 150 images, most of them letters from Hunter to Margaret Ann, published by Norfolk Press in San Francisco, where the story began. And I know that the avatar, Hunter S. Thompson, who is one bookend as the Dalai Lama is the other bookend, both avatars, um, spiritual teachers with poets' hearts leading and guiding people in their totally contrasting ways of teaching. Hunter is an master who is beating his pupils on the back with a bamboo cane, and they doze off their meditation, and the Dalai Lama smiling and sharing his love. Um, but they both 
got us to the same place, which is to wake up, wake the hell up. So anyway, that, um, and I, I want to add that last year, I was blessed to be the first U.S. citizen to be named the UNESCO um, writer in residence to Tartu, Estonia. And that's where, and the folks there put me up in a museum. And that's where I did the, my massive around the clock editing of the manuscript to transform it into, to give it a conversationalist tone, like, like, um, like Bill McKean's outlaw journalist, like historian Douglas Brinkley, uh, like his biographies, some of the best books have that conversationalist tone and, and Martin Nance has that now. And so, um, and, and the last thing I want to add is that Doug Brinkley and I, uh, Doug worked with me, we worked on a number of events and one was in December 1996 to produce the official Hunter S. Thompson tribute here in Louisville and I brought in Hunter, I brought in uh, Hunter's mom, Virginia, his son Juan, Johnny Depp, Warren C. Vaughn, Doug Brinkley, David Amram, Roxanne Pulitzer, and a host of other people for the most amazing four hour event ever. Um, and so there's so many things, as Margaret Ann said, that go into this book. It's an important historical document and that's enough for me. I turn it back over to this lovely lady, Margaret Ann Harrell. Thank you, Ron. Okay, thank you, Ron. Something I didn't, I'm, we're all being spontaneous live. So to, thank you so much. And thank you for like, you also were whipping me every step of the way, you know, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up, which is why it got to this point. It really is. But I want to just add, because I'm also an editor, the, the best thing you can say about an editor which, I mean, it's been said to me, so I recognize it, is when you sent the manuscript back, it looked to me just like what I wanted it to be, just like how I sent it out. <laughs> I mean, in other words, it they were not glaring or, to me, it was my manuscript coming back, <laughs> um, which is the best thing you can say about what, how an editor uh, works making something better, but so that you don't feel it's been intruded upon or whatever. So, I, so that's masterful work. And I greatly, greatly appreciate that and all the other behind the scenes always, 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 always help. Um, so the thank next you, step- Thank you, Margaret Ann. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Ron is truly an unusual person, never stopping. I wrote him, said, I'm barely awake at 10 a.m. He said, I'm up every day at 4 a.m. So, okay. <laughs> um, right, so right now, the next irregularity was the publisher. There's no such, I mean, there's, there, I was told there's no such publisher, and I already knew it. There's no such publisher who's going to publish a book like this. Now, see how much bigger it is than my head? It's almost like two times my head. <laughs> and it's filled with color. And it's 297 pages. And it's, it's um, 9 by 12. What is the commercial value of that? So I was told the only way to publish this, and so writers, you can take hope from this. I was told by a woman who teaches how to get a literary agent. I spent $395 and followed this course. She said, you won't get it published by a literary agent unless you tell them, you'll give them access to the letters, turn in no manuscript, let them decide what to do with access. And I said, they're totally crazy. <laughs> I would never do that. And the estate who owns the literary, the intellectual property would never agree to that. And so I said, no, it maybe we'll have to self-publish. And after a year, of getting wonderful rave reviews back literally from the query, but it's not our, we can't do it. I went to, called up on the phone, a, what looked like a magnificent artistic printer in San Francisco. 
And I was knowing how the woman had beaten me down about nobody's going to do such a project in color. Um, I was very focused. I gave her, my, gave the printer my pitch for a book. I, it was just like I was pitching it to a, a publisher or literary agent. And he stopped me and he said, well, I, I said, what, give me a quote. And he stopped me and he said, I am the president of Norfolk Press. He said, you can do that. We can give you a quote. You can pay for it, but I want to publish it. And I, I couldn't believe my ears. <laughs> what was he saying? And it's true. It turned out they are sister companies. And he, as, as far as I understand it, he's the president of both. He may be the owner of both. He's also an artist. Uh, he, he thought of being a painter. And his friends own galleries in San Francisco. He's very, very artistic. And the printing house does high-end uh, printing, it's like for, for magazines and high-end things. And so I knew that he would, do, he would not do a, an inferior or even average printing job. And so then the thing was, and so I sent my manuscript to him that night in his file transfer protocol. The next day there was a contract in my mail. And so people say, well, that was Hunter. Do it, do it, do it. Uh, up there in the, the ethers helping us. Because the funny thing is, it was like someone was putting things together that you could never, ever, ever find if you like, a needle in 50 haystacks. Because the only reason he could do this book was that he was a printer. Otherwise, he would have to be printing in China or South Korea or somewhere. Imagine right now during COVID, you're, you're sending, plus it wouldn't make commercial sense. They couldn't afford it. So he had every value we had, plus he introduced design elements. In spite of having this wonderful designer in, uh, Deborah, her name skips me right now, but she's a fantastic designer. She's credited in the book. Um, he added design elements. He, he participated and yet let us do everything. So end of story for now. Oh, and I must say part of the synchronicity was that I felt I was being helped by, by so many people, including every one of these panelists. It was like, how could I go in there and, okay, so maybe I do get the book published, but the fact that they had already written things for this book or was standing in the wings to help in Peter's case added to the fact that he wanted the book. And also for me, it continued to bolster my spirits. I couldn't let them down and not get this book published. So I have, I have, it was like I was being held up by I don't know how many people the whole time. Thank you, Margaret. That's excellent. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rory Feehan. I'm going to uh, start a new line of questioning. And Dr. Feehan, why is Hunter S. Thompson significant? And why should writers know who he is? Uh, my worry is that young writers don't know. I mean, I, I talk sure. about Hunter S. Thompson and I'm telling my family and they said, well, we kind of know this guy. And yeah, <laughs> but I said, but you have to know him. He's, he's the, uh, the Mark Absolutely. Twain of the 20th century. So how Absolutely. do we get folks to, to know who he is, although he's not with us anymore? Well, you know, I think the important thing to, for any writer or aspiring journalist, uh, to, that what they can learn from Hunter was his uh, dedication to the truth. Um, I think that's one of the most important strands that runs right throughout his writing career. Um, if you look at when he first got into journalism, when he was in his early 20s in New York, um, he, you know, he, he wasn't afraid to write what he thought uh, or step on people's toes. And it, boy, did he step on a lot of people's toes. <laughs> he got fired several times. You know, he didn't hold back. But that obviously had an impact on his uh, career pro progression. He kept getting fired. Um, when he was in New York, he felt that he was frozen out by the, the establishment there. Um, he felt rejected, basically. And one of the most interesting things about that was uh, he, he vowed to get revenge. You know, he said that he was going, he said that his entire career later on, he said his entire career might have been motivated purely by revenge. For, for not recognizing his genius at such an early stage in his career. 
Um, but Hunter kept fighting. And even though he co continually got rejected and struggled to make an impact in journalism, you know, it eventually did happen slowly. Um, and the interesting part of his struggles to write and not be censored, um, that experience actually is what attracted him to the Hells Angels story. Um, the original media coverage of the Hells Angels was quite sensationalist, uh, Time, Newsweek magazine. And when Hunter read those articles about the Hells Angels, he was actually shocked that none of them had actually bothered to speak to the Hells Angels themselves. So that was, you know, his primary motivation. He said, how can you write about the Hells Angels and not actually speak to them? So I think that kind of goes to the heart of the type of journalist and writer that he was. He was really motivated uh, by the truth and to, you know, pursue it no matter how difficult uh, it was to attain that truth. Um, and eventually, of course, you know, he became the journalist we all know and he had his huge breakthroughs. But, you know, for a good 10 years, he really struggled uh, against what he felt was an insurmountable, um, I suppose, publishing uh, landscape. And I think that's the other aspect of Hunter's story that's quite overlooked is that he wouldn't have had the success that he had without the editors and the publishers that were willing to take a risk on him. Um, you know, that's something that I think is quite relevant today because even with the internet, which, you know, anyone can publish a blog, but there are gatekeepers to wide, you know, the wider media and the wider publishing landscape. And often it, you know, sometimes you feel that people are being a bit too safe. Um, whereas Hunter was quite lucky to, you know, encounter the likes of uh, Warren Hinkle at Scanlon's Monthly, who took a risk. He was quite an interesting character in his own right. <laughs> but he, he was like the perfect editor for Hunter. Um, but the likes of Kerry McWilliams at The Nation recognized that quality in, in Hunter. And even Jan Wenner at Rolling Stone magazine. So these things all happened at the right time with Hunter. You had these radical magazines starting up who were willing to publish him when the mainstream media weren't, or if they were, it was heavily censored or edited, which infuriated Hunter. <laughs> so I think uh, today, you know, I think journalists today can certainly learn from that experience, um, read his letters and see the struggles that he went through, but also recognize that um, quality journalism involves risk taking. And that comes not just from the journalists, but also from the actual publishers. Thank you, Dr. Feehan. I worry in this age of cancel culture and mm. everybody being safe, this could be, um, I don't know who else, who, who can be a Hunter S. Thompson in the future. I'm going to pass uh, our next question over to William McKean. If you could add to what Dr. Rory said about why Hunter is significant and how we can get young folks or people who are in, who are writers to be, to have that Hunter spirit. Well, uh, first of all, I think uh, Rory's analysis is just right on point. Um, I think the word I'd use to describe Hunter is honesty, because what he did was to, uh, and I think it's a tenet of gonzo journalism, is to show the process. Uh, he doesn't just uh, present his, the report, the re results of his reporting as a New York Times or Washington Post reporter would do, because they have to put the news, you know, right at the beginning of the story. And it's all attributed to sources, this or that. Uh, but it doesn't say anything about how the story was gathered. And what I liked about uh, Hunter Thompson's writing was, uh, for example, the uh, from the, uh, the 72 campaign, uh, when uh, the character known as the Savage Boohoo steals, uh, or takes, I should say, not stolen at all, uh, Hunter's press pass and runs wild on a campaign train. Uh, you see Hunter's process as he unfurls the events and you know, he calls somebody, who, do you know this? No, well, I'll call someone else. 
And so I think by, by putting the process into the story, he's much more honest with readers. And a lot of traditional old journalism types will say stuff like, oh, Hunter Thompson, that's not journalism. Whereas I think in terms of actual journalism, it's a, it's a great model. Um, his style and his voice is another issue. I think that works only for him. And I've been teaching for years, always have students infatuated with Hunter S. Thompson. And they always tell me, uh, hey, for my final assignment, I'm gonna write a Gonzo article. I always say, go right ahead. And it's always just a miserable failure. And the point I make is, well, see, there's only one person that can write like that and he's gone. But there's only one person that could write like you. And corny as that sounds, I think it helps people realize uh, that, you know, to develop a distinctive voice, you have to go your own way, which is what Hunter Thompson did. I find that there are a lot of students still, you know, 15 years after his uh, death, who are interested in, in Hunter Thompson. There's a, a block, and I think that's what draws them, is the, the honesty, uh, the commitment, uh, the cojones it took to do what he did, and to be fearless. Did I answer the question? You did. <laughs> okay. You did. Absolutely. I'm going to now, um, we have Peter Richardson out of San Francisco. And San Francisco, I mean, that's the place of anarchy, of the gold rush, of, um, you know, it was always crazy. I mean, since it, you know, before um, the, you know, before, eight, before the 1840s, it was crazy. And then we have Mark Twain. He, he uh, gained his chops in San Francisco. He was a miner, um, silver mining. And, and we have how uh, Hunter was evicted in 65. And, uh, and he was struggling and struggling. And I'd like for you to speak on uh, how San Francisco made Hunter. Thanks, Alice. Yeah, I think that's a really important part of his career and sort of shaped his his um, his outlook and gave him some opportunities that he might not have had if he had not landed in San Francisco. I don't think it was any part of a grand plan uh, to come to the San Francisco Bay Area, but um, he was drawn to the Bay Area probably mostly by what had happened in the 1950s with the beat literary movement, um, and especially the work of Jack Kerouac, who he didn't admire as a stylist, but he really, he really um, was inspired by uh, a particular way of blending um, autobiography and fiction. And um, he saw that as a, big, as a big breakthrough. A lot of people did. And when Kerouac and Ginsburg came to San Francisco in the, in the 1950s, I think it, it sort of touched off something and, and brought a lot of media attention to what was a, a kind of small but vital bohemian scene, um, not just writing, but including writing. And so I think he came here to check that out in 1960. Um, and, uh, you know, the beat scene, it was, was sort of petering out by that time. He was a little disappointed. So he ended up actually going down to Big Sur. And, and that also was kind of a formative period. It's kind of a, kind of a weird decision for a journalist to go down to Big Sur because it's so isolated. But um, it kind of made sense um, because he wanted to be a novelist as well. And it was, you know, Henry Miller was there, uh, Dennis Murphy was there. It was a very creative, but very small little scene. Then when he, he has a couple of ad, other adventures, which maybe we can get to later, but um, he returns to San Francisco in 1964. Um, by that time, he's working for the National Observer, um, which was the Wall Street Journal weekend magazine. And um, he witnesses the Republican National Convention, kind of odd considering what's played out this week in, in the United States. Um, it occurred in San Francisco that year. But there were other things that were starting to bubble up too. And he realized there was a real opportunity here in the, in the Bay Area to do the kind of writing that he wanted to do. Uh, for one thing, he went over to Berkeley and, and, and wrote about the campus activism over there. I know Rory has um, an issue of Spider Magazine, which came out of Berkeley during that time. Weirdly, it was edited by a guy that I took my economic statistics class from at the University of California, Santa Barbara many years later who, by the way, wanted nothing to do with, with Hunter Thompson at this point. He thought 
the entire student movement was a mistake. Um, so Berkeley was one thing that, um, that Hunter Thompson realized that he could cover. Um, the other thing that was happening was um, uh, after, he, after he wrote the article version of the Hells Angels piece, uh, he met Ken Kesey. And that was also a very important uh, moment for him because that introduced him to this kind of broader counterculture scene. You know, he was not a hippie, um, but he, he got a, he, he was, he sort of thrilled on the kind of anarchic energy of the, of the San Francisco counterculture. And that ended up being very important. Um, Rory mentioned uh, Warren Hinkle, who was a San Francisco based editor. And of course, Jan Wenner and Rolling Stone magazine were eventually uh, Hunter would do most of his, his most important work. Those were all San Francisco based. Um, and the, the other thing, the last thing, is that during this time, uh, he began reading the work of Tom Wolfe. And I think that was also super important because it kind of showed him the way, one way to proceed. So Wolfe was a New York based writer, but he realized that there was the stuff that was happening in uh, West Coast popular culture was a real opportunity for him and the kinds of things that he wanted to write about. And when uh, Hunter started reading Tom Wolfe, he realized that, you know, he could do that too. And he was based on the West Coast. So this sort of so-called new journalism was starting to percolate. And, you know, uh, it didn't always include participatory reporting, but um, when Hunter Thompson was asked by Kerry McWilliams at the Nation magazine to cover the Hell's Angels, he realized that this was an extraordinary opportunity for him. For one thing, he was broke and he was, he was leaving the, uh, the National Observer and he really needed the work. But he could see from Wolf's example that you could sort of profile these kind of exotic provincial subcultures you know, on, the, on the West Coast. Big Sur was one um, and, and San Francisco hippies were one and the Berkeley campus activists. But then the Hells Angels became, you know, this kind of extraordinary event and his first real opportunity because upon publication of that article in the Nation magazine, he had never, he had never published in anything like the Nation magazine before. Um, but he was able, he almost immediately began getting um, book contract offers, including one from Jim Silverman. So I'm hoping Margaret can tell us a little bit more about that. But um, so that became his first book. And, and of course, it was a bestseller. And from there, you know, things continued. It, it didn't get easier for him as, as I know Bill and Rory know, and Margaret, you know, even after writing his first bestseller, he was still kind of struggling with how to, how to do the kind of work that he wanted to do. And there's a long, a 17 page letter to Jim Silverman and Douglas Brinkley's in the correspondence edited uh, by Douglas Brinkley that really shows, you know, just what Rory was talking about, which was, this was a long apprenticeship. This guy did just sit down and get high and bang it out. I mean, he was really struggling with his craft and trying to figure out what to do next and the best way to do it. And so I think that there's one kind of important misconception about Hunter Thompson. It's that, you know, the kind of writing that he was doing was easy. You know, I think it was quite the opposite. So, so I, that has to be held up as, as, as part of his, his big contribution and achievement, I think. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, I was I was also um, thinking that you know it's the struggle between between works um, and also he he never graduated from high school or college. Is that correct? I mean, he took classes, but how did he? I mean, he was extraordinarily gifted not to you know to have that education, but to go for it and to be so smart and creative and have a way with his words. That was one thing that impressed me. And I assume that he graduated and more I'm reading, I'm like, well, that was just a silly assumption on my part. Self-educated. Yeah. And, uh, and I think in, there's a lot of writers who are self-educated, but there's a lot of writers today who says, well, I have to take an MFA. I got to go to writing school. I've got to do this. I got to do that. But if you read Hunter, he's an inspiration to folks who say, well, I can do this. I just have to be Believing, I have to believe in myself. And the last winner, American winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature, only had one semester at the University of Minnesota. So uh, it's it's it, it, it's uh, shameful, but 
when you consider that I think some of the great writers of our time, they all avoided higher education. And that may be the reason they're successful. And I think Hunter's a great example of that because he was a, a brilliant guy. I think it, it certainly uh, helped him to have a research librarian for a mother and all the time that he and his pals would spend at the library. You know, they, they'd go play baseball and do other boy things, but then they'd go to the library for three hours and hang out and read Thucydides or whatever. I didn't mean to intrude. I just wanted to add that. Oh, I'm glad you did. He was very well read and I hope everyone knows. I mean, I already, I already always knew that. And when I started going on my writing path in 2002, his name came up every single day. I mean, it was, and I said, I, I just, I knew who he was in the back of my head, but I didn't know. Um, and I said, well, this is someone I have to know uh, just because if you're a nonfiction writer, you just have to know uh, Hunter S. Thompson. So my next oh, question. Okay. Wait, yes. can, well, I, can I add I, something? Very, sorry, go ahead. Mara. No, I was going to say, this is such a, this topic is so important. And so like in the back of, of the letters book, their interviews and everyone there was like, almost everyone was like, has died since I interviewed them at 90 or 93 or whatever. And one is Rosalie Sorrells, who was a folk singer that he really adored. So what she filled in was I knew he read a lot and I felt comfortable quoting, you know, Melville or, or, or Kierkegaard or somebody to him. And I know I did because in the letters I quoted sometimes how to quote because you can't trust your memory according to me. But so I know I did. And she told me she had a library of 5,000 books and she was self-educated. And she said Hunter read everything. And so they would talk about obscure little quotations or, or passages that had impacted them. And he was always open for that. And so that's why I think for me, who likes um, everything accurate and, and, and scholarly, but as Ron said, conversational, I love those, essay, those interviews I did at the back of this book. But I wanted to say I had planned, I want to get this in so it fits. I was by chance um, just Googling and I did Johnny Depp clips from late night shows. And so the late night host, these were going back in time. The late night host said, well, when you do your movie, how, how do you, what do you do with the um, instructions down the side of the script that tell you how to act? And Johnny Depp said, I don't read them. And so the host says, what do you mean? You, you don't read the instructions? He said, no, I don't read them. I want to get my character from within without any instruction telling me how to act the character. So I think that hits on what Hunter did. He didn't want instructions. And in some sense, I mean, I love higher education, but you have to know how to put it aside too, because you've got to get the information from within. And in addition, all the reading he did. So Hunter, was not scripted. He didn't read the instructions down the side of the page. He wanted to draw on his instinct. He used the word instinct a lot. His intuition, he used the word intuition sometimes. I mean, he did to me. His instinct, his intuition, and also actual experienced research, get into the source. He never wanted to say, someone said, someone said, that's my source. He wanted to go to where the event was, but maybe it wasn't an event. Maybe it was just an event waiting to happen. So he wanted to see what was under the surface. It was all live. And I think that's what a writer can really bring. Look inside yourself and find what's living there, what the energy is, what was just waiting to come out rather than read the script, instructions. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Margaret. I think, uh, Dr. Feehan, you had something to say. Um, yeah, um, go ahead I just, jump in. in relation to Johnny Depp, actually, um, you know, he, he himself is uh, extremely well read. He's also from Kentucky. And it's probably one of the reasons why he hit it off with Hunter so well when he played him in, played Raul Duke in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. They had that in common, you know, they very literary. Um, and, you know, I think that idea that they're sure of their own approach, even if it's not conventional, you know, they, they had a lot in common. 
it was the perfect choice. Absolutely. Eccentric. Johnny, Eccentric. Johnny, Johnny has received his copy of the book and loves it. And we're waiting. Um, he, he's going to write a short piece about it. And we're waiting to excitedly to receive that. Well, wait, I, I just want to qualify. We know that he was excited when he got the book. Now, I don't want to presume he's going to write something because he's in a period of rest from a lot of work and tr lawsuits and all that. But deep inside, we know by that reaction that he's going to write something. It's just, a, you know, you know that. But I don't like to ever pressure to make someone promise to do something. But it's, it's very definitely true. He was excited when he got the book. And what that means to me is I don't care, honestly, about the marketing side. I care about the thought in my head that here's someone who loved a person because Johnny loved Hunter. And now he's going to get to read something that brings him alive for him again. So it's for me a heart thing to know that I gave him the opportunity to go back and find something new, of someone alive, you know, the letters are alive, because Hunter wrote a, a quarter of this book, a quarter of it is scans of his actual letters, everything that I received from him, in the color they came in as best you can capture it, with all the doodles, every single thing. So if you knew him, you feel his presence coming back. If I could just add to that, you know, this book and the material in it is the biggest uh, release of original material by Hunter uh, since he died. Peter was going to say something. Do you mind, Peter? I, I really am interested in what you'd have to say. Oh, just a quick um, addendum maybe to an earlier question, which was about why um, young people might care yeah. about Hunter Thompson's work today. One of the things that is easy to overlook, but I think is really an important part of, of his appeal, is everything that he wrote was both coverage of that thing, the campaign trail, Hells Angels, um, whatever. And also it looked the other way. It was also an act of media criticism so that he was very attuned to the ways that, that other news organizations or outlets were distorting our understanding of something. And that's really, that was sort of implied in what Rory was saying earlier, that the, the thing about um, the Hells Angels, in fact, what he said to them when he first met them was, you are completely being mischaracterized in the, in the American media, and I can help you fix that. And so, you know, that, that ability to kind of look both ways um, while he's doing the writing, I mean, over and above, you know, the, the, the incredible imagination, the voice, you know, the satire, there's, there's plenty of great reasons to read all, all of these things, including the letters. I mean, you know, the ones that are in Margaret's book are, are extraordinary. And they're not all from Margaret and, and Hunter. There are some really interesting ones that I hadn't seen um, by, uh, by Oscar Acosta, for example. You know, the 50th moratorium that, that you know, Hunter was covering um, in Los Angeles 50 years ago that led to fear and loathing in Las Vegas. You know, those, you get a little bit more insight into, into some, some other people and, and, and other times as well. But I think that, you know, for young people today who are looking at media and are, you know, the, the, and trying to figure out what to believe, you know, or who to believe, um, you know, his, his way of approaching things and this, and what Rory called, you know, this kind of unvarnished approach to the truth you know, has tremendous appeal. And I think, I think if, if students can overcome what you mentioned, Alice, which is this, this tendency to judge morally very quickly without a lot of information, you know, if they can, if they can stick through this experience and, you know, Hunter's, worth, Hunter's work really breathed moral indignation, really, you know, so it's going to invite moral judgment too. But I, I just hope that people do it on the far side of, you know, a strenuous encounter with what they're reading. And I think if they do that, they're going to realize that they're, they're in the company of a very distinctive American voice, maybe the most distinctive one in the second half of the 20th century. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you Peter. And Alice, as a final note on the subject of young people and Hunter S. Thompson, uh, as a testament 
for the past, this is the 10th anniversary year of Gonzo Fest, um, which I founded with my friend Denny Humphrey here in Louisville in the Highlands. And it has grown thousands of people around the world. Young people of all ages attend it in person. We're going to we're going to have it. Um, we're going to live stream it with some live performance and Zoom interviews, including one with Margaret Ann uh, and uh, Rory this year on Saturday, October the 3rd. But, I mean, that alone is a sign to me, besides book sales, uh, which continue to be strong, that young people are still flocking to the words, the stories, the books, the life of Hunter S. Thompson, and will continue to. Thank you, Ron. Could I just it's, add something there? Please, yes. Yeah, <laughs> I just wanted to also add that, you know, let's not forget that Hunter was also extremely funny. <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> <laughs> he was just so funny. Um, when I was writing my PhD dissertation, I was sharing a writing lab with some other PhD candidates who were doing various dissertations, you know, history, theology, and it was a small writing lab and I was at the back and I had to leave because I was just laughing so much while I was doing my research. <laughs> I was distracting everyone. They were like, what are you writing? That's so funny. <laughs> and just in terms of the appeal uh, as well, it's also international. Um, when I set up my website back in 2008, and uh, it's now the longest running Hunter S. Thompson website on the internet, um, I was amazed at uh, where I was getting hits from around the world, literally everywhere. But some of the most obscure places where you really wouldn't think that there would be a Hunter S. Thompson fan, um, you know, the far parts of Russia and China. And uh, I got hits from Iran and Iraq. I mean, I, I wasn't expecting that. And I got messages from people from all over the world. Um, showing an interest in Hunter, asking me questions about him. Um, it's, it's amazing, his appeal. It's, and I think a lot of it also has to do with those movies that Johnny Depp did, because he's so popular. May I just ask you something, Rory? Sure. I, I noticed that you, and then there's another guy who treated Hunter seriously as a writer. That's European. Why, and at least in the beginning, at the beginning after he died, and maybe still, why is it that it's Europeans like you and, and Marty Flynn also in Ireland? Yeah, who in Dublin. Setting, yeah, who are setting up, Dublin, yeah, who are setting up these serious, massive, global, uh, either blogs or books. Hmm. More so, it seems to me, than in the U.S. You're, they, you're looking at him as a way to see America also, it seems to me. So I, I have always wondered how the, what's going on with that. I think certainly within uh, the context of, say, Ireland and U.K. culture, um, I think it's the sense of humor aspect that really connects with people. And the fact that we really um, appreciate the kind of charismatic rogue figure in our culture. Um, I think that's certainly the appeal of Hunter here. Um, and just the, the humorous way that he ridiculed people in power, that goes over really well over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there is certainly an appeal. I think it's the it's the classic rebel outsider figure as well. It's a, it's a universal uh, appeal, that, that type of character. And he just embodied that so well that people can recognize that instantly. I mean, he was, you know, if you're to make a comparison with music, I mean, Hunter was like the Keith Richards of, of journalism, you know? Um, he had that same charisma, uh, sense of rebellion, and humor about him. Uh, and that's, that's a universal uh, appeal. 
Thank you. And I'll, I'll add to that that uh, I've been blessed. Poetry's taken this farm boy all over the planet, and no matter what country I go to, visit, I, once people find out I'm from Kentucky, the people ask me about her Muhammad Ali and Hunter S. Thompson. Thank you, Ron. My next question, and thank you all. This is this is just a lively this is a lively meeting, lively session. I'm I'm having so much fun. Um, Margaret, next question. Uh, as an editor, you're an editor. I'm an editor. Um, I I felt the the letters come through, and I I shared with you privately that I had some really weird dreams about Hunter <laughs> as I was reading the book. And um, my main thing is a lot of times when you're working with a client, you know. You're you're putting your work in, and then you get um, you get grief, or you get uh, you know uh, argumentative conflict, perhaps uh, from your client because you're trying to do your work, and he's trying to do, or she's trying to do your work. Um, I wanted you to speak on the professional editorial relationship you had with Hunter, as it we see it in the letters, and also um, how that morphed um, into the personal relationship. Um. So it, it's so the way I would edit today or you would edit is so incredibly 180 degrees different. Like I said in the beginning, I would inquire, have a for a month. And if I if it was too loud or whatever at my office, little tiny office, we were allowed to go home and work. And because we were supposed to really concentrate. So the book, we, I mean, we lived the book like it was our own for a month. No distraction, no anything. It, we were into it. Then, and I would make tons of notes. I mean, I had all these notes for me, not for the author. And then say someone would come in like John Irving. And they would make him come in. He was in New Hampshire, his first book. He said, I don't want to come in. Send her up to me. They said, no, you must come in. And so then the writer would come and sit by me. And you could um, so easily, so you, would, um, you wouldn't be a, a prisoner of their turning to a page and being appalled. Nothing like that. You would craftily and understandingly introduce what you knew they would be so happy that you caught. I mean, this here's this glaring error. You could point that out first and they're effusive in gratitude that you caught that. And so then you build a relationship and a confidence and you have plenty of time there that nobody's pushing you to hurry. So that was totally different. But what happened with Hunter was we just abolish that that plan that protocol and he did not come in and so he would be the very reason that he didn't come in was because he was so volatile i guess um and they couldn't imagine jim silverman couldn't imagine him coming sitting calmly for these little conferences and going away and doing the work it wasn't the way he that he wrote so they left him over there and um this was help this besides breaking all precedent it meant that normally speaking for some reason because this was a break in protocol they must have forgotten to tell him that the manuscript had a copy editor or else he just it went out through his ears because he and all the letters you read by him and everything he had no idea he thought the book was finished he was predicting publication date and one day, as I imagine it, and I imagine it in the book, um, plopping down uh, on his uh, doorstep was his manuscript. And we would send the manuscript back and forth because the original was saved and it was everybody's handwriting was in it. And, you, and he, kept, he now, the manuscript is in his estate and you can see exactly any editing, except not all, because uh, in some cases like um, if there was a big little chunk or a paragraph, I would cut out the old text and retype it and put something else in. Um, but, but basically, um, everything is in orange, so somehow it wound up with the original paper. So how did he react? 
the first time when this manuscript plopped on his uh, stoop, door stoop, he exploded in a little brief one, one paragraph way. But that's typical Hunter. He, because once again, everything was alive for him. He wasn't going to say, now, how should I react or let me strategize? He uh, did strategize because he wanted a result. And the strategy was to make a big boom. Let's explode and see what happens. <laughs> because by exploding, he could quickly find out what um, leverage he had, how much power did he have in the situation, and who was he dealing with? Somebody he never heard of. And what, what was she doing sending his manuscript back to him? So he exploded. Naturally, I, with, the, with the situation we used to have, I had writers who, if I can really say so, they adored me. They, would, they wanted to follow me when I left Random House because everything was, was done so carefully with them in mind in the center. And there, there was no pressure. There was mm, trying to be convincing, but no pressure. It's up to them. And so he didn't have that experience. So as I imagine it, because my memory forgets some details, I know I would have gone, getting this letter to, written to me, I, I would have gone upstairs to Jim Silverman and I would have said, well, well, what do we do? And he said, well, uh, he must have said, because what happened was he allowed me to phone him up freely and hunter could phone me now hunter you know love to talk to people 4 a.m or whatever nobody answers the phone at 4 a.m but for hunter they always answered and they were they always talked and i think bill mckean is an example of that <laughs> but um so i phoned him up and meanwhile he got stomped and so the two events coming together gave us a real bond i could i i could pick up the phone hello before we talk about the manuscript, he could say, well, no matter, right now I'm worried about my face. I just got stomped. And then me being me would obviously be um, commiserating with him and saying, what happened? Tell me all that. So we had an immediate bond. And then he understood I had a soft voice. He loved soft voices and Southern voices, as you could see with the way he reacted to my mother and to a friend of mine on the phone in um, California that he heard. He loved these soft feminine, feminine, feminine sounding voices. And so he felt reassured. He felt, okay, it's all, I, I have power. They're not gonna do anything to my manuscript. And so after that, it was like a team, like teamwork. We were working together, so. It's a, I think it's important to add here that Margaret Ann, although her title was copy editor, as an editor myself and as a publisher for three decades, Margaret Ann was the editor of Hell's Angels. Uh, Jim, he put the book contract together and, and gave her permission to talk on the phone and write up whatever bills necessary with postage and phone calls. But Margaret Ann was hands on editor of Hell's Angels. And there's a big difference. And working with Margaret Ann on this book, Hell's Angels Letters, for the last five years, I have never seen anybody other than my sweetheart, Jen Bug, who <laughs> is such a meticulous editor. Oh my God. And it drives me to pre Will and Ron Whitehead crazy sometimes. <laughs> you know, God, Margaret Ann, holy shit. And so, and so, but then, that, you know, occasionally I talk with Jen about it. She said, now you've taken this on. You just calm down and you work with her. And I said, okay, all right, I will. And, but Margaret Ann, she's just amazing. She's an amazing editor. And so it's incredible that Hunter worked with her instead of telling her to go straight to hell. You know, when he received all those corrections on his work, which he couldn't stand anybody changing one letter of anything on his work. Thank you, Ron. I will, I would just add, I don't want to take too much credit because honest to goodness, how could you do that with someone like Hunter? But I made every mark in pencil 
And I, I was like timid. I was very, very introverted. I was afraid to perform in public. I was afraid to speak in public right now. So I, but I was very confident um, in working with books. So I would make little brackets in um, pencil. That meant you're the boss. Here's my suggestion. And my, the idea was, if you don't like this, take it as a, me pointing out that something needs to shift here and you can do it whatever you want. But it's a suggestion to make this a shorter sentence or whatever. And if you like my suggestion, take it. If you don't like my suggestion, make your own. And if you think it's perfect as it is, it's still your right to keep it just as it is, no change. And so he very much appreciated that I had no attachment to making him do anything. And he got that point. And therefore, I call it teamwork. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, it's, did he ever um, confront you on the truth and saying, oh, well, this, this is not, um, and a lot of that comes out in the letters, you know, especially we're talking about how he wants money from Random House and that he uh, felt that you sided with Jim and he was mad because you worked for Random House, that whole thing about getting more money and Jim was really cool about it saying, oh, well, that was Hunter. He always needed money because he spent more than what came in. Could you um, speak a little bit yeah. on that? Well, first of all, Jim loved Hunter and more than I ever realized till later when he was off on his own and I found out about it. He w I thought he was an acquisition editor, but he was also a developmental editor, as which he did very much when he went left Random House and was on his own. But um, he was in charge of, of giving Hunter money. <laughs> and he, he loved Hunter. And so he just took it all with a grain of salt. Um, so he, this is Hunter wanting money. And it, there was no emotional, um, you couldn't hit Jim with an emotion about why he should have money if Jim thought he shouldn't. It was, you know, like black and white in the accounting. And you see, when Hunter came on, and Jim tells this to me in an interview, how he saw it, I, I, I thought, oh, they were horrible, that uh, agent, that literary agent was horrible to Hunter. And so when I, and I thought that all the time, Scott Meredith, he had big clients, I think um, he had very big clients and here was Hunter, a little unknown client. I thought he took advantage of him, which is what Hunter told me. So I believed that, and it is very true in a way, but not entirely. In the interviews in the back of the book, in much later, you see how Jim explains to me. Um, he explains that when they signed on Hunter, I said, well, he hadn't finished a book. And he said he hadn't started a book. <laughs> there was no book. They signed him on on the basis of the Nation article, and which is just, you know, some paragraphs. And so Jim didn't know, is, is this man going to write a book? Can he finish the book? He wasn't so concerned what the book would be like, it didn't sound like, as could he get the pages away from him and would they turn into a book? And so there were, Hunter saw it from one side, they saw it from another, but uh, Jim was never disturbed or angry or personally offended by all these letters that Hunter, where Hunter demanded money and said, he's stealing from me and all that stuff. Jim. He knew who he was, and that was so marvelous about him. He was, he was a perfect person, uh, editor-in-chief, for, for, um, to be above me for Hunter, because he was, um, he was kind of quiet-spoken, very intelligent, Harvard-educated, Jewish, um, rich mind. He loved to take a chance on books, and he loved the, the he loved stories as he would tell me what he liked was to tell a story and so he was sure he was sure he had a fantastic investment in hunter if he could only get him to finish the book and therefore he went out to california so um as to, as to me being torn between the two i was very torn between the two and i and I always reassured Hunter that Jim could not could do no wrong. <laughs> and Hunter would come back at me and say, "Well, Jim told me don't ever look back." And that's a silly, silly, inane thing to say to me. Don't look back when I have no money. And so it was, 
it was very dramatic. I never experienced it with any other author. They never acted like that. <laughs> but Hunter drew me in on the whole entire process while we were writing, and while he was writing, and we were working together and afterwards. And you see, for Hunter, another thing that never happened to another book, this was liable. The, 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 um, in books, I never worked on a book that the lawyers considered might have libel, libel suits. They thought the angels were going to sue for libel or whatever. And so I had to go and tell Hunter. I was the go-between in everything. I had to go tell Hunter, talk on the phone. Hello, Hunter, the lawyers want you to rename this character. They are, hello, Hunter, the lawyers want a document backing up that this really happened. Hello, Hunter, the lawyers want you to go to the police stations and illegally get photostats of um, angels being arrested when there's no public record. Hello, you know. <laughs> and in the letters, you see, so I would tell it to him on the phone, but we have a record of it because he writes back and he writes these beautiful essays on how outraged and incensed he is and what what idiot what he has his own language but the the, the legal people are you know outrageous asking him to do things that are illegally but he managed to do it because there there was a secret story where he got a friend to go back channels politically and get what they wanted and hand deliver it from the west coast to the east coast so it was all gonzo, the whole thing, before we knew the word gonzo. It was, it was that crazy story because he was in it. He was creating the story in a way. And in a way, the story developed around him without his trying to make it develop. But once it developed, his reactions were live in the moment, in the letters. Thank you, Margaret. It, it, just, it sounded there was a lot of stress involved, a lot of um, drama and a lot of stress and you could feel yes. that in the letters and in the handwritten you could feel um, like the the point of the pen you know a thicker point or you could just feel the pressure of the pen on paper um, you, you know it just the the book made it come alive for me Alice can I add, add something to that please yes um, you know the situation that Margaret is describing if it sounds complicated it was nothing compared to what would come later I mean one, I don't want to geek out too much here, but one of the extraordinary things about Thompson as an author is his model of authorship, which evolves into the late 60s and 70s to the point where when Jan Wenner was entering, uh, editing him, he said it was like a full on siege. It was all hands on deck. Everybody had to drop everything round the clock for sometimes weeks on end. And sometimes they never even got the article, you know, so what what Margaret's book is really great at, I mean, one of the things it's great at um, is kind of giving you a snapshot of his incredible fastidiousness and craftsmanship, including where to where to put quotes on the page. I mean, he this maybe Bill can talk about from the it's a carryover from his days as a sports editor. He really cared about what the page looked like. And of course, later when you get Ralph Steadman's il illustrations, it really creates what we now call gonzo journalism. But, you know, over time as his persona evolved, and of course, Rory's written the dissertation on, on the evolution of this persona, super interesting. Um, you know, that the craftsmanship kind of falls away. He's still very fussy about what the story looks like, but he has an incredible amount of editorial support. And, and he, he draws his editors in. And, and over time, it's sort of, he gets them to feel that, you know, you need to be sufficiently cool to edit him, you know, <laughs> and that's how he would draw you into his project. And, and, and he really was tapping the, the expertise and the, and the talents of, of a fairly large cast of, of editors and, and publicists and others, you know, to, to, to create his, you know, his signature works. So could, thank, thank I, you. Just to add to that before someone else wants to jump in. Um, so, so to keep him pacified, Jim told me, he, 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 Jim Silverman, he would use, he, he knew exactly what was going on every minute, including when I had a mouse and a snake in my office. He knew everything. They all thought actually the Bennett Surf knew it. And so 
Hunter, Jim said, keep him happy at a distance. So what he meant was to, you know, um, figure out what would make him keep writing and be happy with the project, keep him happy. And so that meant allowing Hunter to phone me at home. Now, honestly speaking, had it been someone else, I would not like that at all. For Hunter, I look forward to it. So I'm there, you know, is, and he did not phone me at 4 a.m. He would phone me from Colorado at like 11. He was very observant that we were on a different time and he better not overstep. And besides that, he didn't know much about me, my age or my looks or anything. So he would phone up this, this faceless person that he knew he was writing to and talking to at, at like 11 p.m. And I would be like getting ready for bed. And, and uh, whatever had happened, maybe I had had a, a gin and tonic or maybe I had, was lying down half asleep, whatever. There would be Hunter's phone call, but it was so, it was since I, I, I grew to expect it. So I kind of prepared for it, but it was very, very, very exciting because it wasn't, he, he would say interesting things. Every, there was never like he called up to say something dull. He would never, it was never dull, but there were a lot of pauses in our conversation. Some of the pauses were on my part and he didn't, from a distance, he didn't know why I would pause before finishing a sentence. And then he wrote, he told me in person, you finish sentences with vibrations. Now that should tell you an awful lot about him. What was he doing noticing vibrations over phone? But that's who he was. He was very, very sensitive. He could sense that there was information finished in silence. And so we had these silences too. And I was, I was on that wavelength perceiving these same things about him. And that's one reason I saw him differently. I, I saw him on this vibration <laughs> and we were playing together on this vibration. So, um, but he would call me at all hours and that was part of being his deadline team. <laughs> I was just going to say uh, what, what Peter was talking about is I, I think uh, Hunter Thompson thrived and needed chaos. I think he, he did his great work that way. And uh, I was interviewing one of the Rolling Stone guys uh, for my book years ago. I think it was Charlie Perry who said they would be waiting by this thermofax machine, the ancestor of the fax machine, which is of course now dead. But anyway, uh, they'd be waiting for his copy to arrive. And the first thing they'd get would be attachment R or <laughs> insert Q. And he's like, what the fuck is that? And so they would have to when all the pages came in, they'd have to spread them out on the floor and figure out how it all went together. And, you know, if you look at Hunter's career, he was blessed. And I think anyone that's ever, ever written anything knows the importance of the editor to the work. And sometimes uh, the best editor is someone like in, in, in the case of uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, when uh, Hunter gave his first 20 pages to Jan Lenner. All Lenner said was, keep going. Uh, that's, that's a great editor. And, and I think editors have never gotten the recognition that they deserve. Uh, think about the, the formation of uh, what we now call literary journalism, but you know, the, the George Plimpton, uh, Norman Mailer, and, and, and those kinds of people. Without Clay Felker or Harold Hayes, where would they have been? So what I, what I really like about this book that I, I, I would commend it to uh, a lot of students is to say, look at how this editor and this writer work together. And the, the editor helped the writer shape this, this vision. You know, when we started today, Margaret said something that's just, you know, spot on. If you're a really good editor, that means the, the, uh, the writer reads the work after it's been edited and says, damn, I'm good. <laughs> because the, the editor's uh, done the job. So I, 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 to me, what, that's one of the great things about this book is that it really focuses on the writer-editor relationship. Um, and, and again, I think uh, Margaret's one of those editors that's just, you know, doesn't get the, uh, the praise. Ed editors, you know, I've, I've been a, uh, an editor. I've been on both sides of the equation. And, uh, you know, you, you kind of do it for this 
other level of satisfaction, not, uh, let's face it, there is some ego involved in the byline. So sorry to distract, I just wanted to say that. If I could just add to that actually as well in relation to Bill's story, um, when Hunter got that fax machine from uh, Rolling Stone, uh, he christened it the, the Mojo Wire. And one of his tricks when he was trying to slow down the and get by more time so he could keep writing or whatever else he was doing was that he'd feed a page of his writing into the machine and then he'd get one of his assistants to pull out the power cord while half the page was gone through. So in the office in Rolling Stone headquarters, they'd get this kind of garbled half sheet of writing and they'd, they'd contact Hunter and, you know, what's going on, Hunter? And he'd say to them, you know, oh, you, this rotten equipment you're after giving me, it sucks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm going to take it out back and I'm going to execute it if you don't, you know, send me more money. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the funny thing was that Jan Wenner was in on it. He, he knew that Hunter was doing this, but he played along with him just to keep him happy. <laughs> During, uh, I was interviewing Margot Kidder, the actress, for one of my other books, and she said uh, she was with him once when he was on deadline for Rolling Stone, and he, she uh, crawled under his desk to unplug it a couple of times during the course of an evening. So, yeah, that's a ritual, I guess. And um, answering that, I mean, elaborating on what someone just said, I think it was Bill, about editors knowing when to do nothing. Um, so at Random House, I was working on this book um, by the first cousin, close first cousin, Norman Mailer. And Norman Mailer gave us uh, this, this preface or introduction. <clears throat> so I set about editing this. And then I said, oh, no, because if I, made, if I touched anything, something fell apart. In the end, I did nothing because I felt he couldn't be edited, at least for this little piece because everything was so intricate. So he repeated this, you know, a lot of times, but if you started changing anything, you took away. And so I did nothing. And then afterwards I met him at a party in the village and I told him this. And he said to me, he said, yes, uh, sometimes I think I should have been edited, indicating or implying that he never had been. So he said, sometimes I think I should have been edited, but..." I have no idea how anyone could have edited him because of the way he used language. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, a lot of times with, with my editing, it's I'm thinking about the reader comfort. I'm thinking about would the readers understand what's transmitting from the writer mind to the page. And with Hunter, I'd never, I didn't think uh, it, to me, um, his writing made sense to readers. Was that the case, Margaret? That you didn't say, oh, that's a comprehension is issue. It was more of a, stylistic issue. I don't know. Um, absolutely. See, see, again, since he's not scripted, things are coming out. And that's where you get into Gonzo later. But already, yeah. he cared about knowing his subject. So he goes to the source, he goes to the Hells Angels. And the East Coast journalists are just not even probably ever even seeing a Hells Angel, much less interviewing them. Because the the at that time, they may have all been on the West Coast. But so he goes to the source. He has so much to say that it comes out. And then, of course, um, he does work on his style and all some increasingly, as I understand it, less because he masters the ability to hold his uh, material and let it come out. And I remember when I was... Um, at a writer's colony. I was watching, I, I always remembered a writer, she came back in for dinner and she said she had been standing on top of her subject of her book. And standing on top of it, she meant she had it all inside and and in a mass, and it was ready to just pour out in a kind of nice way. So um he did, I mean I, I perceive that his ability was to gather the information and then it percolated inside or immediately before it did much, he was ready for it to come out. And it did. And so it, it, he, when you read in my book, about, and go, by the way, go to norfolkpress.com, you won't find it on Amazon, 
So you can read in my book um, examples of this. Thank you so much, Margaret. I'm going to turn the questioning over to Dr. Feehan now. And we're, we know what gonzo journalism is, but I think we need, uh, you're our gonzo expert on the panel. Uh, please speak on it. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> um, yeah, it's the, it's the question everyone asks, you know, what is it? And where, where did the word gonzo come from as well? Um, the, the word, uh, it's, largely attributed to a journalist by the name of Bill Cardoso. Uh, he was a friend of Hunter's. He worked for the Boston Globe and he had been with Hunter when he was covering Nixon on the campaign trail. I think it was in 68, could have been earlier. And uh, when Hunter published uh, the Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved, uh, Bill Cardoso sent him a letter saying, you know, that was, what was that? That was pure gonzo. Sometimes they say the letter has been quoted as saying that was totally gonzo. It's where I got the name from my website. Um, the, Douglas Brinkley has actually added something quite interesting to that history. Um, he said that when Hunter and Bill Cardoso were on the campaign trail together, that Hunter had a record by James Booker. He was a jazz artist and it, it was called Gonzo and that Hunter loved this song and that he was playing it in his ho hotel room over and over and over. And Bill Cardoso used to hear this in his room and started referring to Hunter as the Gonzo Man. And the interesting thing about that record as well is that the label on the actual record for, for the record label mm -hmm. itself uh, has a peacock, which as we all know, Hunter loved peacocks, kept them at Owl Farm. Um, so it's an interesting uh, little kind of history as to where the word came from. Um, but as for what is gonzo itself, um, you know, it didn't come out of nowhere. You know, uh, there is a kind of a history of that kind of journalism, where do you want to call it impressionistic journalism or, you know, going back to the likes of George Orwell uh, down and out in Paris and London. Um, that was a book that Hunter particularly looked to as a model when he was writing Hell's Angels. Um, it's just this kind of intensely subjective uh, first person account of being at the center of the story, basically. Hunter, of course, amplified that, you know, so much. There was other uh, writers like George Plimpton who kind of practiced the same thing, just not quite to the ex same extent as Hunter. And then what makes Hunter's Gonzo journalism so unique then is the actual character Hunter himself at the center of the story and that, that Hunter figure. Um, you know, you can, you can try and copy what Hunter did, but you're not Hunter S. Thompson. So, you know, <laughs> it doesn't quite come off the same. And more often than not, it comes across as uh, somebody trying to copy Hunter, which kind of sucks. Um, so it was just the, the extent to which he amplified all the characteristics of that earlier journalism and then placed himself at the center of the story and became the story and it became kind of meta journalism. It became the story of getting the story. And if you look at the likes of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, that was originally an assignment to uh, cover the Mint 400 in Las Vegas, a kind of a desert race. And you don't even find out who won that race if you read Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. It's, it's just, that was just an excuse to go there and do his own thing. And it was kind of the same with the Kentucky Derby. You know, it was just an excuse to go and write about all the things he wanted to talk about in relation to his hometown. Um, maybe the, Peter or Bill might want to add to this. I, I, agree with everything that you said. It's a great summary of what, where Gonzo came from and, and what it added and how it's distinctive. One thing, a kind of minor note I would add is there's a kind of backdrop for that Kentucky Derby piece and Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. And it's the specter of Richard Nixon and, and the, the age of Nixon. And, you know, that became a, that became a kind of um, important source for, um, for Hunter Thompson. And I think his best work 
And those two pieces um, <clears throat> deal with the, the age of Nixon, if you will, in different ways. They're, there's, they're usually a kind of backdrop for the action, but I think it's a super important kind of figure ground relationship that it establishes. You know, you've got all this kind of gonzo action in the foreground, but you have to compare it to the lunacy of, of the age of Nixon, I think, to, to really understand its, its Absolutely. Full significance. And if you look at, this is the copy of Scanlon's Monthly uh, that contains the Kentucky Derby piece. And you can see there, impeach Nixon, punch to the face, you know, so spot on. <laughs> I, my feeling was always that Nixon was Hunter's muse and that uh, Nixon, he hated Nixon so much and everything Nixon represented that uh, it drew out his, his greatest anger. Uh, and he would often, uh, you know, find humor in all of this, but he was be underneath it all was this fierce undercurrent. And I think another, uh, I agree with everything Rory said about uh, uh, Gonzo. And I was so glad, I've, I've read his dissertation and I was so glad he focused on the, uh, the idea of the Hunter figure as a literary creation because he was a terrific literary creation. He was also, uh, I mean, it was a, a great invention. It also became sort of a burden for Hunter, I think as a writer and, and maybe a trap, but when it worked, uh, it was great. And I think another element of Gonzo that, that he used so effectively was the idea of the companion. And I think it's in the, the what I consider the first real breakthrough article of his, the uh, uh, post, post Hell's Angels, was uh, The Temptations of Jean-Claude Killy. And it's Bill Cardozo, who is the companion in that piece. And they go around together and they're hanging out and they're muttering under their breath and things like that. And then in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, it's Oscar Acosta, you know, and the, uh, the one about the America's uh, in Kentucky Derby and America's Cup, it's, uh, it's Ralph Steadman. And I think he worked really well. And that to me has always been a, a Mark Twain kind of comparison. You know, you have Huck and Jim and you have Hunter whoever the, and whoever the uh, companion is. So I think, and I, I do know on occasion, he invented a companion. Uh, the, the person in whose mouth he was putting the words was somebody he invented, but they were his words. Uh, so, you know, I think that's an interesting touch. I do think that, you know, Gonzo should be listed with Hunter S. Thompson's sole proprietor, because I just don't think anyone else can do that. Can I lob one more thing onto the pile here? And that is just that <laughs> the difference between Hell's Angels and and these Gonzo works. I mean, there are stylistic differences, but really, it was really the 1968 and especially the Democratic National Convention that kind of politicized him in a way. I mean, up until that point, he was doing these almost ethnologies, right? Ethnographies of the Hells Angels or Big Sur or what was happening in Sonoma County or, 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 or other places. And the political, the political importance was, you know, very secondary. But after the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, he began to turn his sights to, to the political class. And I think that raised the stakes significantly. And it, it, it um, became much more interested in politics, both locally in, in Colorado, but also at the national level. So that's another pivot, I think, between Hells Angels and and the, the material that's usually um, held up as the, the kind of gonzo masterpieces. Yeah, I want, to add, I want yes. to add one thing, a central aspect, and most important as far as I'm concerned to what makes gonzo is Hunter pulled the rug out from under the scientific method, just as quantum physics did for science. It shows, his work shows the fallacy of objectivity. And it's only, it's the experimenter changes the outcome of the experiment. And, um, and so that's something that's not really talked about much, but it's his subjective approach, which everybody has discussed. And, and Rory so eloquently states, 
putting himself into the story and how that changes the story um, is central to what it means to be gone. So that's all. And, and, and also, um, I mean, I don't want to say something can't be done today. People have imagination, but um, there was no internet. There was no iPhone. So how are you going to cover something unless you copy another reporter? You go there. And so he was always going somewhere. And it's, it seems to me that it's essential to Gonzo, al almost essential, that you actually go there and be on the spot. So he always did. And I also wanted to say, um, there was not a million points of view then because there was no internet, no um, everyone telling their own point of view about something. And so you expected there to be some sort of research foundation or some sort of factual foundation or personal experience. You didn't expect things to pop out of people's heads just because they felt like jumping in and and being noticed so so part, so part of the so to have gonzo the way he did it it was it was helpful that there wasn't the internet he had to go places he had to had to find the story and then make the story and see what was in and even in the, con the republican national convention he was experiencing it and going there live so and that. If I could just add to that as well, that um, I think that it's important as well to notice the distinction between what Tom Wolfe was doing and what Hunter was doing, because they often, particularly with the Hell's Angels scene and the Merry Pranksters in San Francisco, they covered the same kind of events. And Hunter really admired Tom Wolfe, and he actually gave his uh, tape recordings to Tom Wolfe. And Tom Wolfe then t transcribed these for a chapter in his book, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. And some people actually thought that he had plagiarized Hunter, which it wasn't the case. Hunter had cooperated with Tom Wolfe and given him his tapes. But when he was asked about it, I did have to laugh at Hunter's um, explanation. He said that uh, Tom Wolfe was too crusty to participate in the scenes that he was observing, whereas Hunter was right in the middle of it. But the tape recorder aspect of it is also quite important because Hunter would bring it with him everywhere and, you know, record his thoughts about what he's actually seeing happening right in front of him. And sometimes he just let it play while he was talking to somebody. <clears throat> and that's used um, quite effectively for a chapter in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, um, Breakdown on Paradise Boulevard, which is basically a transcription word for word of a tape recording of Hunter and Oscar at a taco stand. Um, you can actually, I have the recording, it's, it's incredible. Um, you can buy it as part of the Gonzo tapes, um, but you can see that he, he gave the tape to an intern in Rolling Stone and said, here, transcribe that, and that became the chapter, and you can check the chapter against the tape, and it's word for word. And that's kind of something that he was trying to do with um, what he was trying to do with Gonzo, presenting that unedited account of a scene. Back to um, you, Alice or Margaret. <laughs> no, I was, I was just going to say, had it been 50 years later and I received this manuscript, first of all, it would have had different coverage, I'm absolutely sure, but with the Me Too movement. So I, I had been asked this, and the, the point is that was 50 years ago, so he didn't go into his reactions on, on like this rape, gangbang, whatever scene when he put it in. Um, had it been 50 years later, he would have probably said more of it, how, how, how he experienced it, what he thought of it. Had it been 50 years more, just supposing this wild chance that he didn't go into it more, I would have, as an editor or a copy editor, I would have asked him, well, how did this affect you? How did it, what did this mean in your life? How did it affect your wife? What, what do you think about the Hell's Angels in circumstance? like this and he would have had an answer for today but he didn't because he kind of passed it over because it was thin so thank you for adding that margaret and i dr feehan i have a burning question just it is an absolutely burning question 
<laughs> so, <Go ahead>. um, <laughs> so I grew up, I grew up with the Muppets and I always have adored Gonzo the Muppet. And, uh, for those who don't know who Gonzo the Muppet is, um, here's Gonzo the Muppet. Um, and I'm always thinking, okay, well, Gonzo the Muppet, uh, he's a bird or turkey like creature. He's an alien. He's an outsider. Uh, the other Muppets don't know what, where he came from. He likes chickens. He likes other birds. He's a reporter. <laughs> he likes to throw himself into situations. He likes to expel himself from a cannon, which we all know that <laughs> Hunter's ashes were expelled from a cannon. So I, you know, is there a connection or is this something that my imagination just is running away with? Well, it's funny you asked me that. Uh, I actually wrote about that in my dissertation um, about that link and uh you know there's some very humorous scenes that just they really go, do, do well to explain both gonzos mm -hmm. um in one of the movies uh gonzo is what they're all the the animals are going on to like noah's ark and all the muppets and then gonzo goes up and he's on his own you know they're all going in twos but there's only one gonzo, gonzo. <laughs> so he's so he's turned away <laughs> you know, there's only room for two and you're unique, but they decided not to take him. And in one of the other movies, uh, Gonzo is being shipped in a crate uh, to England, I think, for some reason. And on the description of the crate, when they write what's in the box, they just write whatever. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it kind of, it's perfect, you know? I think so. So, um, do you believe that they're related though? That's certainly in terms of spirit. <laughs> All right. I love that. I love that. Yeah, Gonzo is one of my favorites. I yeah. looked it up for you and it's not it's not easy to find. The closest I could find like research was in 1970 there was a character on a Christmas program. I think it was the Ed Sullivan show of Muppets mm -hmm. and they had a character did, which did not have the name Gonzo but was the progenitor in 1970 December mm -hmm. and in 1970 but he did not wasn't named Gonzo. In 1971 Hunter mentioned uh, the word Gonzo supposedly in uh, in the uh, Rolling Stone articles, and there, there is bad, and and at that point, um, some one of the creators, one of the artists, um, started giving this character from December a personality and a name, Gonzo. And so it seems to me, so, I, in 1970, I don't think that the Muppet creators, they didn't use the word Gonzo. I don't think they had, they, it, was, it would have been such a tiny world if they had known the word, that it's just not possible without an internet. But by 1971, um, they must have been reading Hunter and Rolling yeah. Stone, and they indeed must have liked him and they created this they went back to this 1970 December character and pulled him out and gave him this personality and name so it seems to me that's too big a coincidence to it was a tribute it's, yeah and a good one <laughs> yeah. Alice can I ask a question of uh, our participants yes please um, I'm just wondering just show of hands maybe um, how many people are Joan Didion fans? Okay. I'm just wondering because I, I also think, you know, she's somebody, Rory mentioned Tom Wolfe and, and another new, you know, practitioner of new journalism uh, at that time, especially was, was Joan Didion. And I think there's a lot to be learned from comparing the two. They also wrote about some of the same things, including Haight-Ashbury. I mean, her, her first big signature work really maybe is slouching towards Bethlehem. And it's a look at the San Francisco counterculture and she's horrified, you know. And of course, that's the, that's the, the counterculture gave, um, you know, was very inspiring and, and, and energizing to Hunter Thompson. And I think even though they're both new journalists that, that and they, they, ha they, you know, they have this kind of literary style and they import the techniques of fiction into their work and um, there are many, many points of contact. Their differences are really, are really quite notable. And I think you can learn a lot about both writers by just comparing 
um, um, Hashbury is, and now I'm forgetting the full title, Capital is the Capital hippies. of the Hippies, yeah. and, um, and Joan Didion slouching towards Bethlehem. I mean, that, that, that kind of captures a moment where, you know, she's recoiling from this social disorder that she sees in the, in the youth culture, and he's getting off on it. And, and then later he looks back on that period, which included the Hells Angels period, as a kind of u utopian moment for him that he continues to draw energy from. I mean, into the early 21st century, he's still writing about that from time to time. So, so I think that might be a, another way to get at, you know, what, what his contribution was and also a great way to get back into John Didion. You know, there's a, yeah. uh, I, I talk about this in my class every semester uh, and I draw that comparison about the use of the self where uh, they're, they're both right in the first person. But uh, Joan Didion always said that she was, uh, she knew, knows she's a good reporter. Uh, and she says, that's because of my size. She says, I'm <laughs> such a small person that, and so inconsequential that people you know, forget my existence. And that doesn't work in their favor because she's a great reporter at you know, capturing people in their you know, full blown assholery. So they both kind of get the, they approach a subject in, in a somewhat similar way superficially in that they're going to be the, the center of it. But Joan Didion is never intrusive. Hunter is whatever he writes about. It's about Hunter Thompson trying to write a story. But his persona, the one that, that uh, uh, Rory studied so well, his persona is self-deprecating and it's endearing, whereas to contrast again with someone else, Norman Mailer. When Norman Mailer's at the center of a story, you know, you just think, get this blowhard out of here. I want to, you know, I want to know about this fight. I want to know about this, but, you know, the, the, the trip to the moon. But there's this guy who's in the way. And Hunter Thompson was always central to the stories, but he never seemed in the way. He was a great guide. So anyway, I, I think that's a really good comparison because there are two writers covered basically the same thing and did it in such different ways. I, I think my favorite Joan Didion piece from that era is when she sits in on a Doors recording session and just watches the tension. It's a brilliant piece of work, but it's, it's like 500 words, 700 words, somewhere in there. Thank you for adding a female um, gonzo journalist too, because I was thinking it must be very difficult for a woman to go into the same situations as what Hunter did. Um, oh, and before we, before we wrap up, we have, we have a question from our audience. Uh, the question is from Tracy Barton Barrett, and the question is, I'd love to hear the panel's thoughts about what Hunter would be doing if we were still, if he were still alive now, especially with the parallels with the current administration and Nixon. Well, I'll start because I have a short answer. Okay. If, if Hunter Thompson was alive today, he would kill himself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't mean that to be necessarily disrespectful or funny. It's just that I think he would not recognize where we are in, in this country today. And I think he, he uh, deep down, I mean, I don't think there was, I, I think he loved the idea of America. And I, I, I think I, I, a lot of people ask this question, what would Hunter do? What WWHD? I, I, I just think he would check out all over again. All, all the panelists, thank you, Bill. All the panelists hear that question so often. It's a legitimate question. My right. response is: I see Hunter sitting on his throne chair in the kitchen at Al Farm, with the Book of Revelation open, his eyes white, rolled back in his head, slobbering at the mouth on the seizures. <laughs> That's pretty vivid. <laughs> How about you, Rory? I, uh, you know, I think, um, I think he kind of predicted where we are in a way. Um, I think he hoped he wouldn't arrive at this point. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that his last two books were titled, you know, Kingdom of Fear and Hey Arub, the Bush administration, Blood, what was it? Blood Sport, the Bush Blood administration Sport. and the downward spiral of dumbness. And I think, you know, he saw where we where we were heading. Um, 
I think uh, certainly, you know, I know Ralph Stedman has said about what's happening right now that on the one hand, Hunter would kind of enjoy the chaos on one level, but I think he'd be, you know, deeply disturbed on another um, that his worst fears had kind of come come to life. Um, I think he'd be, you know, and I'm coming at this from an outsider, you know, so <laughs> uh, I think uh, I think he'd be disappointed at kind of one aspect I think he'd really be troubled with is how the media has reacted to Donald Trump. Um, and I think it's something that can't be overlooked that to a certain extent, and it's, it's the nature of the media landscape nowadays, um, is that outrage fuels clicks and advertising. So to an extent, uh, fueling the outrage fuels ratings. Um, so the media has played its role in elevating Trump. And I think Trump knows that. Um, I think Hunter would have recognized very quickly how Trump was manipulating the media and how perhaps the media on some level was willingly cooperating on a, in a bizarre way for the sake of business. Um, and I don't think Hunter would have uh, appreciated that. Um, I think he just would be disappointed at everyone that's involved. You know, I don't think anybody comes out of this current situation looking good at all. Um, and, and that's one thing to remember about Hunter is that we all know that he was very critical of Richard Nixon and Republicans, but he was equ equally critical of the Democrats. Some of his most vicious writing is actually about Democrats. So I don't think he would have spared anybody <laughs> in the current environment. I think everybody would have incurred his wrath the Democrats, the Republicans, Trump, the media. Um, I think, though, that if you're looking at which hunter you're going to talk about, though, as to how he'd react to this, I think the young hunter would have been energized and got stuck in. Uh, but I think the older hunter would have been just, um, you know, what Bill said. It wasn't his fight. I don't think he had the energy to deal with the, the stress of covering the current situation. I think, think he'd, he'd be heart heartbroken. Yeah. Yeah. Heartbroken, exactly. Yeah. I, I would, I, 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 sorry. Go ahead, Margaret. I, I was, mine is kind of short, I think. Um, so I agree with everyone, what they said, and then going a little bit further, and I count on them to access what Hunter would do. But for me, I, I always look at a person as, as you don't know what they will do because they can always surprise you, Hunter most of all. So I don't mean he would surprise us in a disillusioning way, but I mean, um, suppose he were healthy because he was mm. not healthy, so he couldn't go on in that way at all. But suppose he were healthy and energized him, the way we see him, he could come up with something unpredictable. David yeah. Streitfeld said maybe he would be speechless <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> but if he wasn't speechless, um, since he was always going in and having his own view of things, I, I, I like, like to think, I have no idea how he would create something that I'd be fascinated to hear. Um, but there's so many perspectives, everybody, and they fall apart. And, you know, the cycle of the news is up, down, up, down. That didn't suit him at all. He, he wanted what he said to last and make a point and be like Kilroy was here. It has meaning mm -hmm. and it's true. But um, I like to think that agreeing with everything everyone said, I, I like to think he would have taught me something. He would have surprised me. He would have had a perspective I cannot predict because everything that he was happening when he was alive in 2005 has shifted so how would he reshift to, to like as he always said he wanted to boil a story down to a boil of sand a, a grain of sand to see a world in a grain of sand and use that grain of sand to find an entry point that he could find an audience of absolutely everyone not, not educated 
educated anything. So what grain of sand would he have used in this chaotic? And he yeah. always, he, he did like chaos. I mean, he, he seemed to be able to go through it and find it, it, it gave him a direction. So I have no idea of me personally, but um, I agree with all the others at the same time. When somebody asks that question, what would Hunter do? And then I say he'd kill himself. But then I follow it with, I have no idea. Because to me, he was unpredictable. And he would always find a different way of looking at the story, something unique. He was a, a one of a kind. I would just add, you know, to Rory's point, one, Carrie McWilliams' granddaughter, who's now a professor of politics out here in California, wrote an article for The Nation a little while ago that said that basically Hell's Angels predicted Donald Trump. And she sort of traced out all the different ways in which that was so. So, you know, the, the uh, kind of expert political observers are, are actually going back and, 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 and retracing his steps in that way. I think there was one big challenge that, that Hunter Thompson would have in writing about, for example, Donald Trump, and that is, you know, his basic kind of foundational trope was hyperbole, right? There was this kind of, you know, he sort of hit the mark by overshooting it, by raising the subject kind of excessively. But when you call Richard Nixon a werewolf, where do you go with Ronald Reagan? You know, there's, there's not a lot of room left there. So I think that, you know, uh, uh, Bill and Margaret are right in the sense that he would have to sort of re-engineer something, re, you know, create some other um, mode of attack in a way. But I, I think he could have done it too, because I think he really subscribed to the idea, the, the Kafka idea that, you know, literature is the, is the pickaxe for the frozen sea within us, right? So you have to kind of cut through all the objective journalism and all the rules and all that business and, and try to say something really true, not only true, but um, something that will move people and, and make, them, make them more receptive and more human. And so that, that's what I hope would happen. It's, but uh, you know, who knows? It's, when someone's unpredictable, you can't predict it. Thank it's you all so much. Yeah, but- It's, it's interesting just, that you, sorry, do you wanna go, Margaret? I was just gonna say in one sentence, if he was projecting out 50 years ahead, how do you project out now? I would love to see how he projected from now where we're going. I would love that if he did that, and why not? He was very astute politically in, in terms of making predictions, actually. And it was interesting that Peter mentioned his take on Ronald Reagan, because before Reagan had actually decided to go for the presidency, when he was still governor, I think, of California at the time, Hunter wrote a letter and he described Reagan as a grinning whore who will probably one day be president. <laughs> so I think you, you can go throughout his actual political writing and you can see all the, the moments, if you, as you said, as Peter said, someone had Kerry McWilliams niece had traced back. You can see all the moments where Hunter is showing where the political, uh, environment is developing that leads to where we are today it's it's quite remarkable uh, in a way um you know he was and i think you saw that in his own campaign for sheriff how astute he was politically he Absolutely. predicted he predicted the middle eastern wars i, I mean immediately um September 11th, he immediately predicted, you know, now we go into Middle Eastern wars and we, yeah. he had his own colorful language about how horrible that was going to be. He was already against it before it happened. Uh, we are running out of time, everybody. Unfortunately, we could have this go on. Uh, I've got two things to ask. If everybody could unshare or um, share their screens. And so if your screen is blacked out, go ahead and turn it to your face. And I'm gonna take a quick group picture and then I have one final question for the panel and then we're gonna, um, we're gonna wrap it up and I wanna thank our panelists for their wonderful time. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and let's go to gallery view and everyone show your screen, please. And I'll do a quick group picture. All right, if everybody's ready, um, go ahead and smile. And one, two, three. <laughs> one, two, three. Okay. Final question um, from Robin was, 
who will take up the mantle of Hunter S. Thompson? Is there a contemporary writer today that is Hunter-esque in their own unique way? Do you want me to go first? Or? I was just gonna say my advice, because I get students like that all the time, is don't try it. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is done by a professional. And, and don't try to emulate it because it's like trying on someone else's personality. It's not going to fit. So uh, that's in terms of the writing style. In terms of the, uh, the passion and uh, you know, becoming part of the story and all that, you, that part is acceptable. I think other people can do that. Go ahead, Rory. I've got, I've got an idea. I, I, I actually missed the question. If you could just repeat oh. the question. It's about who's, who can carry the mantle uh, oh, okay. today. And I know. Um, well, it's, you know, nobody's going to be exactly like Hunter. I think in terms of political reporting, there's only one person I can think of right now who's writing the kind of journalism that I think Hunter would have appreciated, and that's uh, Matt Taibbi from Rolling Stone magazine. Um, he certainly has picked up um, aspects of of Hunter's uh, political style. Um, and again, willing to be critical of both sides, willing to take an unpopular uh, angle because it's the correct angle, it's the truth. Um, he's not afraid to shy away from uncomfortable opinions and he's getting an awful lot of flack for it, but he's sticking with it. And, you know, I did enjoy uh, his talk at uh, Gonzo Fest last year where Matt talked all about how Hunter had influenced him. Um, I do recall he said that he had inherited uh, Hunter S. Thompson's job and hairline. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Taibbi's, I think, the, the person to watch there. He sort of absorbed that influence, you know, and, and came out the other side. I mean, to, to Bill's point, I, I, he's not an yeah. imitator. There was a time when he was coming pretty close to being a Hunter Thompson imitator. But I think the, the work that he's done over the last 10 or 15 years now has been uh, very solid and super independent and, mm -hmm. uh, and willing to take you know, some tough positions. In fact, I think he's kind of dialed down the gonzo in many ways. Yeah. Um, and if there's a book length work to recommend, I mean, this isn't his most Thompson-esque <laughs> book, but... This book, The Divide, I think, is, is really quite extraordinary. Yeah. And his latest add, work as well. I want to add that Hunter and I talked about this, and Hunter, like myself, abhorred anybody being anything but their own original voice and self. And so nobody can be like Hunter. Uh, nobody should try to be. Everybody should find their own voice and express it. Um, naturally. So that's my closing comment is find your own voice, find your dream, build a bridge from where you are, live it and be it. Thank you, Alice, for doing a magnificent job. Thank you, Margaret Ann. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you all the incredible panelists. It's been a blast. Thank you all. Thanks, Ron. You all are wonderful. Um, thank you all panelists. We just wanted to thank Margaret Ann Harrell. Thank you, Ron Whitehead. Thank you, Rich, uh, Peter Richardson. Thank you, Dr. Rory Feehan. Uh, Dr. William, uh, Dr. William McKean, you all are incredible. And thank you for sharing your gifts and your knowledge and the time. I mean, I knew it would go by fast and I, and I thank our, our participants for coming today. We are on Facebook Live and the recording will be there. We're also going to have the recording that uh, was recorded um, from Zoom that will be available through the Meetup page, which is where you found the link here. And really quickly, our next book for Wonderland will be, if you liked this one, um, please join us next month for Dr. Elaine Orr's Swimming Between Worlds. That will be Friday, September, 12th, with September 25th, which is uh, Margaret's birthday. And also, uh, also my um, my uh, my son's 18th birthday. So um, it'll be it'll be quite a red letter birthday book club day. So I, I want to hope you can join us then. 
I have one last thing. Alice, you are amazing. You managed this from your spaceship command and it was, you kept us moving. You brought everyone in. I am so grateful. And to all of these, these panelists who are my friends and I'm in awe of them because each one has such a special expertise and success at work and authorship. And so it's amazing to hear what they have to say. So I'm very, very grateful. I should also mention Grant Goodwin. I told him I'd mention him. He yes. is the, the uh, cartoonist and illustrator of the yep. book. He did the cover and inside. He's fantastic. He's, he's a young guy, a Ralph Steadman, um, somebody that Ralph has taken under his wing. I thank him so much and the, the designer and the audience. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, uh, this was so much fun. All right, thank you all so much. I hate to Bye, say everybody. goodbye to everybody, but we have to close sometime. <laughs> it's closing time. Bye-bye. <laughs> we all see you soon. Thank you so much. Cheers, everybody. We should everybody. do this Thanks, once a month. It's such I think fun. so. I think so. <laughs> Go buy the book. North Bye. Press. Bye.